Um, so we're now back online, I think. Um, and welcome to our three speakers, all up at the front at the moment, um, and, and Paul. We're going to open it now, open, open the floor now for um, comments, questions, discussion, um, until about um, 4.30, when I'm going to ask Paul if he'll um, sum up and uh, we can then um, think a little bit perhaps about next steps, where we, where we go from here as far as the RSS is concerned. So, I, 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 over, to, over, to, over to you, who would like to start? If you could give your... She would like to speak. Okay, <laughs> all right, one of our speakers. Thank you. I have a question to my two co-panelists. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, both of you talked about comparability and about flexibility. Um, and of course, most of my work is on poverty, so that's my, my world. And in poverty, it's very clear that every country has a national poverty measure made by their Office of National Statistics, and that's what matter, matters for policy. But when it comes to comparability, then they jump over to the $1.25 a day done by the World Bank. And so it's quite convenient because we follow the same structure with the MPI. There's the global MPI, which is comparable. And then we are working now with a network of 40 countries, and a number of countries have official national statistics that are national with very different dimensions, weights, indicators for the context. So that's proven to be quite a useful rubric that allows space for both. And I just wondered, Denise, if you were happy with that. And Michael, if, you were, if that was where you were going with the MPI. Yeah. I'm very happy with that. I think that's. Um, that is the right approach, that you have data that is local to the questions that need to be answered for that society and of relevance to them. And then you try to um, extract from that the data that you need in order to produce the comparable uh, indicator. So where that's possible, I think it's great. Um, the difficulty we've had is that sometimes the, the international standard has driven the local um, and the statistical system has been developed around the international standard and then there are difficulties about um, who owns that data and whether it's actually useful you know, um, at a local level. So, um, but I think the approach you're taking is the right one. Yeah, that's very much what we're doing. I mean, we see this as an opportunity in the sense that we're trying to measure since 12 concepts and underlies those progress. And then we're going to measure them in different ways. So actually you can create the flexibility of creating sub-national indices that are only different sets of measures that are trying to measure the same concept. But actually we can compare the results. And actually maybe we can learn something about these different ways of measuring those concepts is by applying the different ways of different data availability, different contexts. So actually we haven't really learned from that over time. So it's actually a big opportunity as far as we're concerned. I just want to say, we're going to plug for the hashtag. Um, well, I think we've got, we've got a hashtag. Hashtag RSS indices. So if you're in the Twitter sphere, then please do um, tweet us on that hashtag. Thank you. Thank and you very right, much. I'm not being rude. I'm not being rude. That would be helpful, Sorry. I think. Okay. So, uh, David McEwen, uh, my role is tourism statistics. And uh, I have a little bit of experience with composite uh, indices. And uh, the question I want to ask is, uh, particularly in light of what we're saying with the shift with the weighting, is often, uh, sometimes after your inputs are coming along, you actually find your index isn't going in the direction one would anticipate intuitively. Similarly with the weighting. So I'm just wondering, what do they mean if you start up something which after a while you alter the inputs and you alter the weighting? What exactly are we measuring? Mm. Who would like to take that? Paul, I think. Excuse me, we took several questions together. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've touched on a kind of real concern, which is that. Um, you can design something. Um, Michael and his colleagues can design something and put down a set of, set of weights. Um, but where, 
where those weights come from. And, and, and if you leave it open for people to change the weights, um, what, does that, what does that mean? Now, statisticians have put together price indices over the many years, managed to do both things. They, they, they like to kind of change the weights each year to reflect the kind of current spending patterns. Uh, but they also kind of have a kind of constant price to set the weights. So you can see what would have been the position had you kept the weights the same. Um, without having a, a kind of, an, uh, without having my kind of course at, uh, at, uh, at Imperial on price indices in the next three seconds, um, the question is, you know, there are pros and cons to that. The statistically, you can see what's going on. If you've got extra information, you can see what's been the effect of changing the weights. But in terms of complexity, you've now got two bits of information about sort of purporting to measure price change. Uh, in, in over, over a period, uh, and what you learn, what you learn from that is, is this: is this meeting the needs that people that people have? So I always kind of try and bring these things back. What actually are we trying to do? Here? Why are we putting these indices together? What what are, what is the purpose? And I, I'm perhaps being over optimistic, but um, can we, during that process of determining why we want them, can we start to answer some of the questions like should these have fixed weights, or, or where should the weights come from? Um, now, maybe that's a naive assumption, but I think it's just you put the right to raise it. We should recognize that the weighting as well as the components are, are integral to this. So, can I just answer? I, I'm fully supportive of the idea of trying to do other, other measures. But I think the other question is uh, of course, with price indices, we are mostly aggregated models, which have a certain advantage. It's when you start to aggregate um, you know, very, very different ideas, say, of electricity consumption. Uh, this does make it very, very difficult to lay down also in the social theory. Mm -hmm. Can I just say two things? One is that I think it's a very good question to ask in terms of where do they come from. And as I explained, weights in a multidimensional measure are not like weights in a your standard composite measure because they are applied on the zero one deprivation matrix. But following Marquez then, it's worth saying that um, his opinion would be. Um, that weights should reflect the relative value, that that should be the subject of public discussion, we will not all agree, but we can also often find a range of plausible weights. And so what we do in the multidimensional measure is use fixed and given weights over a period of time, say a decade, change them once and do all the comparisons of the year of change, but um, then do robustness tests. So in the case of the global MPI, the dimensions are weighted one third, one third, one third, so the robustness test is if one is weighted 50% and the other two at a quarter, what's the impact? And as I said, 85% of pairwise comparisons with standard errors are the same. So that's the kind of territory of transparency we're trying to say, which is recognizing legitimate plurality of use, but also the need to carry on with one, one vector of weights over time. I'm, uh, I'm Claire Everett from the Office of National Statistics, and responsible for quite a lot of things, actually. Um, in particular, the sustainable development goals <coughs> and work with the UN, but also for measuring national well-being. And I just want to comment very much in support of exactly what Paul said about purpose. And the purpose of these indicators and the use and how people have used them is worrying at times and, and quite supportive with others. We currently use 10 domains to produce a measure of national well-being with about 40 indicators, roughly four to each, and there's no right answer. But it's 12 and 52, yeah. better life index users, yeah. and the list goes on. And it just, we have resisted very much of trying to weight these 41 indicators, largely because it would hide what's really the story beneath. So, what we've introduced is just a, a measure of change, just on each of the indicators, just a simple traffic light for policy users to see what's going okay, what's going badly, but look underneath. And I suppose we've talked about GDP, and for my earlier sins, I was head of national accounts. Uh, so, oh, well, responsible for. Um, but the reality is, almost no one uses GDP. Yeah, the policy, the fiscal policy, monetary policy, don't use GDP as a headline measure. They look what's driving it. Is it the, is it the trade? Is it foreign investment? What, what is it beneath it? And we're trying to, I think, do the similar thing with measuring national. Overall, it's, it's progress. You know, how's the UK performing? And we're looking to sort of see how that, I'm picking up sort of 
carry on with it. The mapping of indicators. We've mapped our 10 domains to the Better Life Index, to the 17 goals, 12 goals, what the Australians have done, what the Canadians have done, what the UNCES has done as a sustainable development framework. And the similarities and overlap are enormous. You know, and you can just rattle off you know, these areas that people are concerned with. Education, health, the economy, the environment, labor market, these sorts of things. They're, they're all common in all the structures. So how do we get that into one number called GDP is one, one approach. The other is don't try and do it. Put it out there, but educate people to actually start using more and, and seeing it's, it, it's complicated. So it, it, it's almost the individual weights that OECD do, which also worries me because I've been there and they have people playing, <laughs> they're keeping records of people trying to play with the weights to get the right answer. <laughs> so, so, and also want to do a bit as well. <laughs> Thanks very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, I mean, one response to that, I think, is you know, there are multiple users of these kind of measures. So that's something we're trying to understand. And I mean, we've been very lucky that um, the New Orleans Organization supports the Rockefeller Foundation. They actually said to us very early on is you should actually have an ongoing user study and actually do some qualitative and quantitative work with the users to find out how they're using it. And that's been incredibly valuable to us, understanding how different people use that. I don't know whether other experience has been in that kind of field, or whether well, our access more broadly or from other people in the, in the group. But I think that getting that sense of user insight to help us refine products I think is really powerful. I think actually, um, from the RSS's um, viewpoint, um, getting that sort of user input, I agree, is incredibly useful, but actually very difficult too. <clears throat> and it would be quite interesting to know how you've gone about that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I, I mean, this is early stage. Yes. Was actually, there was um, I can't remember all the words. There was a template with a whole. It was actually an environmental index that uh, was evaluation being done. Like I can't remember what it was called. It was the start as a template. But then we've done both, we've done some work through kind of just online survey, just seeing who's coming to the website, where they're coming from. But then very much qualitative research with people who are actually using it um, in different communities and actually trying to just get a sense. I think what we, we need to do is actually build a time series. I think what we've got now is people doing their initial reaction. What we need to do is come back in two or three years' time and see how people are using it again. What we've also done, which has been useful for us, is actually doing not just people who are currently using data, but people for whom we think the data might be useful. So there's always a prospective evaluation, and that's been very useful as well. I mean, it will, we'll publish, um, we'll publish that report shortly, and we're really lucky to get the feedback and similar experiences. So could I just say in, in the measures that we use, I, the global MPI is one thing, but most of the action is around the national official statistics in Mexico, Colombia, Bhutan, Costa Rica, El Salvador, um, many different countries now. and I think there we've learned a great deal. For example, um, having one number means that they can set a target, as President Santos did in Colombia, to reduce multidimensional poverty by this by 2014 as a political goal. He then had a ministerial roundtable, and the ministers couldn't send delegates. And so then they had to sit around, look at the 15 indicators, it's updated annually, and then for each indicator, when their the trend was not significantly decreasing, they had a special policy intervention. So when they present the, the time series, with their policy responses, they tell the story of how looking at the measurement, looking at the trends, then change their policies. So I think that's that's been quite useful. And then also a government like China, which has used the multidimensional measure to target 90 million, and then they first had a, a trial and then, then it went national, but learning from them about the insights and the oversights of having that kind of targeting versus another. Clearly for us, most of the users have been policy, not citizens. So our, our cutting edge is how do we engage citizens, um, but our primary goal was for the use of the policy. So in a sense, that's been our first sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mike Fleming, I wonder how often you actually exemplify the construction of the, in the composite index by seeing the marginal effect when you change one of the components. So how often is that done? Because to me, that would be the most transparent way to a 1% change in this would do this. So you can have a little panel there. We just tip it. I just wonder how often that, certainly that's what I would do if I was trying to explain 
a composite index to a policy. Yeah, we have that formula in the book and in our papers. I think that the, the weakness in ours is that the unit cost of delivering a 1% change isn't necessarily the same across this. And so we haven't thought through the public expenditure implications of this, and we need to join hands with folks who do that and then rethink the ways. Should it actually somehow also reflect the public expenditure implications of the changes or not? But um, that, that could be done simply by, if you knew the cost, by saying a thousand dollar increase here would result. But one of the difficulties is getting the cost because yeah. one of the problems that I used to have when I was responsible for these data in, in UNESCO is that increasing um, uh, child participation in primary school from 60% to 65% costs the costs are very different from increasing it from 95 to 100% for example so it, it's not a linear relationship it's extraordinarily difficult they, they're hard to reach are much much more expensive to get into our systems and so actually having good cost data is very very difficult but it's it's important that we do try because one of the difficulties is that very often um, policy makers will will get dispirited by the data and they won't actually understand that they can make a difference um, and it needn't necessarily cost a fortune or if you put that cost into into context so the one we used to quote was we used to um, compare the cost of educating a child to the cost spent in the UK or Europe on ice cream and you put it in that sort of it sounds trivial but what you're trying to do is you're trying to demonstrate that actually in the scheme of things you know we could we could solve these problems if we decided not to spend money on trying, for example, not, not putting any political statement. <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> putting that context is really important. Please, please. please. Um, it was actually that your point that was back in my mind when I was saying that, that you're saying these are arbitrary, you're saying these weights. Oh, the weights are, are arbitrary. They can't be entirely arbitrary. They must be some statistical. Variation not entirely arbitrary, surely. Oh, okay. <laughs> Two definitions of the words. So, if they're exogenous, if that's the use of the word arbitrary, yes. So, they, our weights are normative, so they're not a PCA weights based on some sort of PCA or some sort of statistical latent variable model or something. Um, and that is the use of arbitrary, which is intended here. And in that sense, they are arbitrary. Clearly, we also do robustness tests, and they are not arbitrary. They're based on public discussions, a human rights framework, different things in different countries. But in a lingo, I think you were using yeah, the arbitrary. I, in my sense, given that they're normative, they're, they're arbitrary in the sense that somebody else can come along with a dis different set of priorities and say, I would have weighted these this way, and that would get a different result. And if it wouldn't get a different result, if your system is, is invariable, uh, varied in relation to the weight, then that actually means that you've got correlation between the different components and you're measuring the same thing again and again. And as I was saying, we, we want to avoid that in our composite indicators because we're trying to get different dimensions. So um, I wasn't, uh, arbitrary is a rather strange word because it sounds pejorative, um, but I do think it's important that we're honest about this because, as I was saying, so many people think that they, the weights are determined according to some fantastic scientific process. That isn't how the weights in, say, the, uh, the Human Development Index were determined. Is it perhaps better to describe them as subjective yes. rather than arbitrary? I mean, arbitrary sounds as though you've just literally pluck, plucked random numbers out of here. Oh, yeah, I think they could be contested. But I, know, I know that, yes. yes, yes. yes. So, so, so they're subjective, and, and in that sense, one person's view, one institution's view, one country's view, can be very different That's than right. others. But that's I like the word contested. It's important to identify a range of 
plausible ways and the yes. robustness tests within that range, acknowledging the plurality, but also that there are limits that, you know, how it doesn't have zero value for many people who take that. Yes. Can I come back on the, the first part of your question, which on this thought about change? Is that, I mean, this is entirely, you know, a hunch I have about the world. Is that things don't change because of single point causes. That it's not about an expenditure on something changes something. But one of the things that intrigues me is how we can see how different aspects of social progress are related to each other, and how it may be actually there are different, there are different pathways and there are different equilibria. Um, that actually this should help understand how what the sequencing of these different things are, what the multiple causes are behind different outcomes. We don't have a time series to do it, so I'm going to bring unfairly answer to Tina. Whether well, since you've got time series, do you have insight into what those how those different ten different factors relate against each other in terms of generating outcomes? Is there a sequence of these different as aspects of multidimensional property? Yeah, no, that is still at the stage of research, but it's a very clear one um, because that's needed by policy. Is you know, what is the proper sequence of events, and to do that, you actually need to be able to compare different policy and environments and things like different sequences, either finding a natural experiment or something like that. So. Research in progress with the proposals and don't have that yet. Okay. That actually indicates two sets of marginal changes, doesn't it? One, if it could change on its own, yeah. the other is likely implications for the change on the other end. So it starts to get very complicated. Yeah. You're going to have an index of marginal changes if we're not clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and the other factor in that that um, complicates it even further is population size. So population size, um, because we know that sometimes our progress isn't as fast as we would have liked because the population is growing and therefore we've got more to do, or the contrary may be the case. And so that's another factor that comes in with this change over time. And it's very interesting that most of the, uh, of the goals are in terms of the percentage that you achieve, so the percentage that are in school or whatever, rather than the absolute numbers. And just to give you a concrete factoid, in 2.5 billion people in 34 countries, there were statistically significant reductions in 31 of the countries. But when you look at the number, it was wiped out in 18 of those countries, and the number of poor people increased. So we always, therefore, report statistically significant and number of poor. Just for that reason. At uh, risk of taking on, on the science half this, but that slightly worries me your confidence in the world and your statisticism. For that, you need a probability model. You need actual valid distribution behind it. Yours must all be empirical. It's, so you, have, you can't really do genuine confidence. The only people who can do genuine confidence in the world are sample survey people. Everything else is. Some assumed model of the errors. And, and therefore, you know, it worries me a little bit people using confidence intervals where there isn't actually anything random about it. Actually, because all of the variables come from the same household survey, then we derive standard errors from that survey and the PSU and, and using the set, survey sets command and data. And um, we also double check with bootstrapping. And so the analytical standard errors and bootstrap standard errors. You know, they're a little bit different in X decimal point, but we've done that just again to publish it to sort of show the robustness of, of the measures and which standard errors we should use. Thank you. Other points, come. Yes. Ajmal Hassan. Uh, my question is around uh, the user capability gap. In fact, it has made me think of the two sides of capability one is the user side and the other side is the producer side. And I'm looking at it from a producer side, though I'm on the statistician, uh, the converted statistician. Uh, I think there may be a, a need to work closely with the so-called uh, CSR community, corporate social responsibility, in the corporate sector. And uh, that could have a lot of potential, in fact, for addressing the producer capability and companies as such now produce, especially large companies, produce over uh, 8,000 sustainability reports. Yes. Now, not many of them have got inputs from uh, a statistical point of view, especially work relating to poverty, poverty 
election, for example, and it is in their vested interest, in fact, now that the companies have identified fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, and they've all gotten done. So it may be useful to work with the CSR community at that level in sustainability reporting so that the producer capability gets addressed. And any investment in that has benefits for the user capability. So the user certainly will have respect for the good work that uh, many of us are doing and get the support, sponsorship, and so on and so forth. It's just to take the corporate sector closed. Now that they're converted, they begin to understand that they cannot be left alone to the governments. Corporate sector is one, and the NGOs and foundations are one. They are working in fact deeply, and in many cases they succeed where the governments fail. So, I wouldn't say that we've done very much, but I would just say one thing, which is that in Costa Rica, we're working with Bolivian Deposit Viva and some private sector groups, and they've decided, um, because Costa Rica just launched its national NPI on the 29th of October, to do a, an employee survey covering the households of employees and identifying which of their employees live in MPI households by the national, poor households by the national definition. And, and so that'll be a test case for us. Um, so we're trying to you know, then do Gallup level simplified questionnaire, still valid, which is not easy. Um, and then think about how, how that can be used. Basically a census of employees, it seems like employees. But others know much more than I do. <laughs> you know, I think it's something trying to integrate what businesses in particular do into a common framework of reporting is very much what drove social progress index project. But I think it's right, sustainability reporting is so much focused on companies reporting a lot on not doing negative things. Um, <laughs> and I think it's a sad thing because also what companies can't do is tell the story about their core operations that actually may be making massively positive social contribution, not just in terms of income and employment, but whether it's the provision of information technology or provision of another basic service or it may be the way that corporations contribute to um, human rights as a you know, rule of law. So that's where the businesses contribute, um, you know, positively and negatively. And I think the way that there is that challenge now to business that it can't be socially neutral. You know, I mean, this post-financial crisis world, business has got to really explain why it is socially useful, creating some, some framework that actually is useful for business to tell its story in a complete way, and not just about this narrow window of CSR activity, is really, really important. You know, we're talking to businesses, we're lucky that the Lord's supporting us, uh, and so they're very much looking at ways that we can integrate this into the corporate reporting. Work in progress, um, but very much don't really see it being a big opportunity. And I think also, you may say about foundations and NGOs, but I do think it is a case that, you know, we do have had this issue that sometimes in the world, you've had, you know, official aid agencies like Giving Right to Work, and the UN bodies of the World Bank have one language, and sometimes foundations have moved in this to a different data environment and try to bring a kind of common data environment across those different actors. There's been progress in the last 10 years, but ever more creating that common understanding of common data environment is going to be really important if we are going to get those collaborations across sectors. Okay. Can I answer? I think that this is going to be one of the biggest changes that we will see in the statistical system over the next few years. I mean, we tend to talk about it in relation to big data and the fact that a lot of the data that is produced is not necessarily coming from government. So we need better cooperation with the private sector and with other sorts of organisations to, to harness that information. But I see it as being really critical in the areas you're talking about too. More and more, we see that um, employee, employees are asking of their employers that they are paying attention to how they're contributing to the world. Um, and some key employers are now looking for, for how they can, they can do good works. Um, until relatively recently, when I was at King's College London, I had humanitarian futures. Uh, colleagues who were working on how you bring the private sector expertise to bear in terms of uh, humanitarian projects. And those of us who've worked in poorest parts of Africa, for example, will know that we go to a remote village and Coca-Cola has always got there before us, or Pepsi has got there before us. They know about distribution in a way that 
governments don't, um, and don't, governments are ineffective. So actually harnessing that expertise, um, and we haven't, I think, looked enough as to how we harness that expertise in terms of building better statistical systems and so on. So, um, and if we want to get data on inequalities as we need to for the SDGs, that's a huge challenge for us. We've struggled for the last 15 years with getting aggregate data for countries, but getting inequality data across a range of different indicators is going to be hugely problematic. We can only do it if we, if we bring in the expertise of um, the private sector and, and NGOs as well. And the other way in which they contribute is that in countries where you've got political misuse of data, certainly NGOs will often help you challenge those data. We just point you to the fact that you shouldn't believe them and why you shouldn't believe them and what the problems are. And I, I found it really helpful to have a good network of NGOs that understood what we were trying to do and worked with us cooperatively to try and improve the quality of the Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Hi, how are you? Um, the SDGs were supposed to be different from the MDGs in two ways. One is that it was universal, it would apply to all countries in the world, and secondly, that you integrated that approach. Uh, meaning breaking the silos, trying to better understand that policy making in one area will have an impact on each area. How that integration is supposed to happen is still unclear. Uh, there is a phrase that is increasingly coming up called policy coherence for sustainable development, which is the means policy coherence for sustainable development, which is the means to which we can achieve this integration. Uh, is there a way, is there any thinking? about whether or not policy coherence can be captured through either a multidimensional or cross-organization. Is there any work in that area? There has been some work in that area. I, um, I'm very well aware of a small group that has been leading um, in terms of indicators of good governance um, and trying to get them better on the agenda of the MDGs and now the SDGs. Um, and, uh, and there is some hope that they will be able to get some of these indicators in uh, under the MDG 16, is it the one that talks about justice? Um, so good, one of the issues of good governance is the extent to which you have um, governments that are working that aren't siloed, that are working across, that that are not pulling against one another in terms of resources, but actually pull resources and work effectively together. So um, I know that there's a team that have been trying to push that area. I could put you in touch with one of the people who's been instrumental in that. But I don't. I wouldn't say they've made radical changes. I think it's it's uh, incremental. Can I perhaps ask Glenn if he's got anything well, to add? I there. had a bit. There's a, actually a prior city group that's actually taking forward the work on the government. We're trying to come up with better measures of trust and, and basically gone through the whole goal 16. But can I also pick up a bit about the challenge to NSIs uh, for the SDGs? And you know, I sit on one of the UN expert groups, and UK is one of the more developed countries with a statistical system. and most on that group have no chance at the moment of meeting the principle of leaving no one behind. The disaggregation that's required is an enormous challenge. I'll try and do a but where we're going to work on it. Um, and I think some of it is a cultural change for a lot of NSIs. You know, we work on official statistics and very much we've got to break out a bit more to work with the NGOs, with civil society, with the third sector, with the private sector, to actually see what else we can't do it on our own. You know, the official stats can't do it on their own. But I think you know, that critical review, it, it's a challenge that Paul's put up, is almost how the, what's good enough? Do we have to kite mark all this information? Um, a lot of it's good quality stuff out there. We shouldn't ignore it. And, and I think 
just for information, I think later in December, there's a meeting in Paris, the Paris 21, which is nothing to do with the city, it's coincidence. Paris is an acronym for Partnership for Improving Statistics. Um, and the OECD is sort of hosting, trying to get NSIs and how we work better with private sector, third sector, civil society, NGOs, to actually take some of this work forward. So there's hope in some respects, and with the SDGs, what we're putting forward, I call it you know, version 1.0. So what comes out next year will be not the end, and it will have to be refined and improved as we go through it. And I think we'll find over time the disaggregation will get better and further. So we might start with a suggested a headline from a survey, but can we get big data, admin data, third sector information to actually help us disaggregate it? So we can meet the challenge of leaving no one behind. So whether it's ethnicity, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's disability, it's going to be very difficult in developing countries, in developing countries, let's say, with good systems are going to struggle. And that's, that, that was across the piece. You know, how is it going to be for the developing countries? And building their statistical capacity is more a challenge. And there's things happening in our global partnership to actually help take this work forward. Thank you for that. Michael, did you want to Yeah, I think this is a really important point. I think you know, the proliferation of, of other measurement efforts is not just a problem, it is an opportunity. Yeah. Is that there's a lot of people, we have to be one of them, are trying to work on finding new ways of measuring this stuff. And that, that actually is a contribution to this, yeah. this wider, the wider process. And I think sometimes we can see proliferation as being a problem. But actually, proliferation does mean there are different approaches and innovation to be tried to do different things, and that we see as a big opportunity. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Emily. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I think that um, I agree with everything that lots of the points have made today. Thank you very much for the really interesting presentations. I think that the challenge for us um, is trying to make sense of if there's a proliferation of these different indexes. Particularly with this big no one behind agenda, there's various indices coming out of the woodwork for the skills development or for you know a different a targeting different groups and looking at what the garden looks like for those groups. And there can be so many of these indices that you kind of you can't see the wood for the trees, it's all a bit confusing. Um, and so I think the mapping that we talked about earlier and being aware of the different indices and what component data goes into them, what data are they using, how do they deal with data gaps, I think it would be really, really useful. It would also be really useful to hear speakers a little bit about how your particular programs are sort of taking into account this, this need for more disaggregated data and looking at different groups of the population. When I had a look at this report and you talk about geographic disaggregation principles, but are you doing any work to look at whether you can look at different population groups um, and how that's coming out? and um, and also in terms of pushing to increase the availability of the source data that enables you to break those down a little bit further. So it would be, be useful to hear a little bit about some of those challenges from your perspective as well. So in terms of our case, um, because of the structure of the measure being based on um, household profiles, we can disaggregate to any group for which the data are representative. Mm -hmm. So for example, ethnicity. And we look at Benin over time and the Kula is the poorest group, no change. So they're being left behind. All the other ethnic groups had faster changes. Or in Kenya, Somali, the poorest ethnic group, made the biggest change. So we do case studies. And ethnicity is five. I find there are five, six, seven groups. But you know, some countries, Nepal, 109. <laughs> so, and the algorithm that's usually used is just to add them up by size, which then makes all the anthropologists come at your neck. So the problem for ethnic, ethnic decompositions is basically What's the family structure of ethnicity, if you yeah. don't know? Um, children are fine, so we do age cohorts. Um, and of course, so do kids and whatever. Um, gender we can do, but with this measure, we really would like a gendered measure. So Mexico, Bhutan, we have gendered data, and we can do it properly. With this measure, you know, it's basically 50-50. It's representing the population structure because we don't have in the data sources that we use data for men. So um, we're, we have basically household level data. Um, and then in the rural urban, we do for every country, um, rural urban desegregation. So a lot of that is, is quite easy, and that's just because of the structure of the measure. 
that it's a counting-based measure and it's subnationally decomposable as a property of the axiom as a property. Um, I think when you're using aggregate data, then you, and you're blending different data sources, it becomes much, much more complex. What our cutting edge is, is when we are integrating some satellite data and environmental data, the sample design of those and the representative geographically is different than the representative of political groups. So now we're tearing our head out about, you know, sample representative and environmental data when countries want to merge, like China, they want to merge pollution, you know, this kind of data into the poverty measure. So I'm not there yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, hello, I'm Nicholas Sambolis um, from my question center. I have one question, and uh, again, I'm not an expert in quantum computer, so if it's uh, uh, not relevant, please excuse me. Uh, the question is uh, if the scope of an index is among others to influence policy, have there any, uh, been any experiment in terms of um, letting households, for example, uh, make, um, making choices on the way of different communicators? Uh, so what were the results of, of all of this? Sorry. Um, so uh, in South Africa, uh, the index of multiple deprivation, which they had for a time, was based on a socially perceived necessities questionnaire that had come actually out of the UK and the, the bread line survey here. Um, and what they did in their index was then they aggregated and they looked at the average percentage of people who said this was essential and desirable for people in South Africa today. Um, however, Mark Fleurbe uh, is with uh, François Maniquet in Belgium has, I think, the most cutting edge work on this in terms of empirical data on preferences. And they've got nice funding for a fantastic survey um, where everybody's preferences will be quite comprehensively get gathered at the same time that their functioning data will be gathered. And they would like then to put individual level vectors of weights alongside the achievements. And technically, it's absolutely possible, even with our methodology. The nightmare is interpreting the results because um, both the weights change and the achievements for each person change. Um, and so uh, the interpretation will require a bit, um, a bit more work. But uh, I think that's very big where people, you know, theoretically, I'm an economist, and so in that discipline, we really have to have an account of preferences when we have these kinds of indices. And so returning to some of those fundamental theoretical questions means that we have to ask why do we aggregate preferences and get the same weights? And what difference does it make? So minimally, it'll be a robust check. And hopefully, it'll, it'll take us to some of the different ways. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Carl Allen. I'm not a statistician. When we use the multidimensional indices from country to country, and the, let's assume we have the Antarctica good set of indices that we know how to use. And we apply them nationally. But how do, you, how do we apply them globally so that although it's good nationally, we avoid it being bad globally? Mm. I'll put it this way, which statistician is going to tell a country mm. that yeah, it's good nationally, yeah. but it's bad globally. Yeah. This is the making of choice about us. There could be a policy like that. If they get more economic growth, they can make it have negative global environmental consequences or something. Yeah, of course, everything that the industries <coughs> will tell us on a national level that we should do, yeah. that's good at a national level, mm -hmm. inevitably, because it's one group. Yes. Yeah. Some things are not going to be good globally. Yeah. It's part, I was trying to get at some aspect of this from what I was talking about in terms of sort of imperialism, mm -hmm. in terms of statistics. One of the difficulties is that we do have to make judgments in what we collect across the world as to what, what is important and that isn't necessarily conceived of as being important within countries, and we are calling countries to account. And I remember 
having really difficult discussions about whether we could afford to have growth in every country of the world. And it's one of the arguments as to why um, we've got indicators that now look at the environment as well as, as growth, because um, it's, it's a way of trying to get a balance across different uh, different priority areas, but um, countries, I mean, countries are told by international agencies that they aren't performing adequately. Um, and there are those difficult discussions taking place. Um, but the trouble is that everybody comes from a, a particular a particular priority set, a particular paradigm, and so on. So, um, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Um, it's sort of interesting because I was listening to some of the conversations on the Ekin's approach to global warming. So there was one Chinese speaker who said, um, look, first you have the MAC policy, which is mutually assured destruction in the nuclear arms race. And now we apparently have a MAC policy, which man-made warning. China is saying, well, look, it can be. Maybe we will have to tell the rest of the world, being the largest country in the world, we will have to start using our trading power to dictate, in a sense, what we were just talking about. If you want to trade with us, recognize that there are limits to national approach because of global responsibility. So some of the powers, well, I shouldn't say so. That's the only country I've ever heard about that is a think tank saying that we can't have a map policy. No, what I was going to say was I think you know some of the um, some of the new areas within the SDGs, um, some you know Particularly, you know, Denise mentioned um, the difficulty in, in language, the word justice. But justice is something that means very different things to different people. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's, there, there's a classic um, example, I would say, of, of, of the sort of thing that you're talking about. Yeah. And that some, some sort of some sort of global view has to be taken of what is good justice and what is not good justice. Yeah, I mean, the example we struggle with is, you know, one of the SDGs is around the uh, the ocean. Uh, now, how on earth are we going to measure each country's contribution to that? Yes. Well, how we have to sort of, do we attribute a share of the world's ocean okay. resources to each country? On what basis do we do that? I mean, that's just sort of incredibly complex. I think also there's something I think was sort of hinted at just now was, also about thinking about the future. Are we future-proofing our measures? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to what degree are the SDGs really forward-looking enough? And is there a danger there? Um, in a past life, I worked at the, uh, the Home Office. And I remember we had this fantastic presentation a few years ago about knife crime. And I'm looking at this presentation, and this is fantastic. It's a presentation about knife crime just at the moment when there's a big political concern about knife crime. How did you manage to get this research done very, so quickly? And the director said, well, actually, we did it three, we started this three years ago when they were concerned about gun crime. But we sold the business as a knife crime with a pipeline to gun crime, so we got permission to do the research. <laughs> <laughs> and what is, you know, we need actually to be, in terms of data we're gathering. And I must say, what I do think is miss, missing in the SDGs, and I think we are going to have to think a lot more about how we measure, is aging. Yeah. And I just think that's one I just, I cannot find decent data on quality of aging. We were talking at the break about mental health. The mental health. Yeah. Mental health is really, really poorly represented. It was in the MDGs and it is in the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, so, a final point. So, as um, statisticians, I'm not a statistician, we will have to be clearer about what strategy we use to, as you say, future proof our work in presenting it at national level. Yeah. 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 Sorry, just an update. There will be, well, there's these proposals to what 
the mental health of the baby is in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go and do it. Good. Well, there's a young gentleman wants to talk to you. <laughs> I said that it wasn't closed, yeah, and they're well, still lobbying, but it's it's, yeah, like, it's it's in the current list. Yeah. There is something on mental health. The other, can I just talk a little bit about the global blood measurement? Just picked up. It just struck me. We talked almost the start of the talk was about GDP, mm -hmm. and GDP has not stayed static over the years. It gets updated. There is a system of national accounts that gets updated regularly. And the current thinking is you know, the globalization of industry and how we record it better. It's the exporting of the carbon footprint elsewhere. You know, we're importing from China or other countries. So it is a challenge to the national accounts of how we actually better record it. I just wanted to mark we haven't got the answers yet, but there is work in progress looking at the system of national accounts, how we can better account. For a country's impact and yeah. what it may mean. Yes, indeed. Well, another question, Pete. Well, it, it's um, quite useful to have an insight into the two sides the social uh, indices and the economic indices, and they both make sense. And uh, we've come a long way, and yet, of course, there is quite understandably a lot of work to be done in that area, and problems are quite well highlighted, in fact. So there is another area, technology. And uh, there are a lot of technological indices, innovation index and so on and so forth, uh, internet readiness index and so on. And we also know that the population we are considering, in fact, many of them, half, the country, half of those countries have a young population. We also know there are millennials. And we also know there's large amounts of youth unemployment. So to what extent could we introduce technological indices to overcome some of the problems and difficulties we have. And some of them may take a long time and a lot of effort or resources and needs to work on. And if the, the technological indices can be used to advantage, then I'm beginning to think that in the future there is a trilemma. And if we can work with these three at the same time, there will be an overlapping interest to serve the needs of the social index, equally the economic index, and opens up a new way ahead so that the younger population, the millennials and so forth, uh, do not look upon these indices as, uh, well, it's not only coming from uh, advanced countries and uh, from established uh, frameworks, but also from an aging population that may not be addressing the future needs of a growing active population that uh, needs to be addressed through policy initiatives. But the policy makers are, are held back because of the two pillars they have, the social side and the economic side. And technology is rather young and new. If we look at the advent of the internet from 1996 onwards, there's not a long history of that. So to what extent, just because we may not be able to complete this round, that we started. We could uh, go more into that so that there's a balanced perspective to an index which works towards the well being, especially of the growing uh, youth and uh, the millennials, people with uh, social media applications and the rest of it. Just a thought on how to address the, not just the dilemma which we have, the two, but the trilemma which would solve the difficulties we have in the two. In some ways. I think so. I mean, I, I mean, the point about technology, I think, is very well taken. I think we seem to be slightly stuck in this debate, generally, globally, about we've gone from this utopian view about technology, about how we're all going to transfer our consciousness into machines and live on Mars and all the world's problems will be solved, to sort of this dystopian vision. But technology must play a role. You know? The Harbour Bosch process to fit nitrogen from the atmosphere is keeping billions of people alive. Yeah? Obviously, there's a whole infrastructure around that supported that. But if Messrs. Harbour and Bosch hadn't come up with their process, we wouldn't have had the Green Revolution and all that agriculture. I think technology must play some role in this. I think I'm, you know, that's gonna, yeah, that is going to change the game. How, where it is, I don't know. We'll have to see how, how that evolves. I think also this point about participation, I think, is really important. And I'm really excited about is that if we're thinking about the way the global demographics are, 
the access that young people now have to information, the capacity to gather and process data, I think seeing the next revolution in how we measure the success of our societies coming from not the usual suspect places, I think is really, really exciting. And I think it will happen. I mean, many people have different um, case studies as well, but there are very fascinating case studies, whether in Paraguay or in the Philippines, of young people acting as data collectors for uh, a survey which is linked to the National Sample Survey or, or, or something else, but then doing a bit of a census in their own community um, or a random, a random sample. And then having, you know, in the Philippines, a very simple software that they can upload it and that providing data for local governments. So I think there are quite empowering ways of doing that. In Paraguay, using stoplights and you know, interviewing people. So I think that's another uh, fascinating way of seeing the agency of young people both to understand and to address their problems while gathering data that can serve other bodies as well. I'll just take one more um, question or comment and then ask Paul uh, if he would like to sum up this very wide-ranging, very interesting discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, uh, David McCoy. Um, the question I'd like to ask is that the GDP, of course, has been the most incredible success. And let me say that as tourism thing, we're actually trying to aspire to get to GDP or things that match GDP. It, it, and this really goes back to the point Michael made. It was in terms of a composite index, like it's in poverty or environment or social, uh, how important is it that this should be understood by the public? Because GDP is actually vaguely understood by the public. Some of a lot of these indicators are really okay to find past statisticians who may know what it is. But how important is it that actually we have composite indices that actually are understood by the public? I think that's a very good question on which to conclude, actually. Mike, would you like to say? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, understand is not about understanding how to calculate. I think understanding in terms of being able to speak meaningfully about. And I think we do have a case that someone can say, well, oh, economic growth should have got you this year. And their friend next to them or the next class school will probably understand that. And I think that's where composite measures have to be, whereby you can say multidimensional poverty or social credit or human development. And that is a meaningful thing to the other person when they hear you speak about that. I would think that. Um when there is a crisis of legitimacy in statistics, it can be quite useful. So when we've done national measures um, in Colombia, <clears throat> in um, one other country, this is stopped, Chile, in both cases, when they launched their national NPI, that year there was a crisis in their income poverty series. Um, and people couldn't understand why they couldn't continue the series. Um, it was too complicated. And so there was a crisis of legitimacy. And at that time, both having another measure, a sister measure, but also having something that they felt they could understand. They won't know all the gory details. No need to. But in a sense, the storyline is clear. And Mexico posts its new files that it uses to compute its national NPI two weeks after the data are, are, are clean. And so having that degree of both transparency for the academics, but also some kind of storyline to citizens, I think is important. And it's also important for the private sector for example, in Colombia, they do a, a mapa social, a, a map, so that the private sector not only understand the measure, but then see where are the pockets of poverty near their plants, how do they intervene, and then they map the CSR interventions um, around them. And so I think some, some aiming in that direction can be quite useful. Otherwise, what they are doing is they are basically citing somebody else who's an expert who told them it was worthwhile. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think people can do more than that. Well, I think it's part of a democratic system that we have to have a population that is supported and educated to be able to um, understand broadly the statistics that are being presented. And unless you do that, you don't have a challenge where statistics are corrupt or statistics are being misused, misrepresented. But it is also, um, it, it also is the responsibility, I think, of the statistician. Um, to, to make sure that what they're doing um, is um, understandable, is comprehensible, is presented in a way that um, enables people to um, feel that they know what is going on. As you say, Michael, the man on the next bar stool knows what, what 
when you mention economic growth, has a vague yeah. idea of what it's all about. Yeah. So, thank you very much indeed, panel. Thank you very much indeed to everyone uh, who's contributed to the discussion. I'm going to ask Paul to attempt the impossible and to, um, to draw all this together um, in, a, in a summing up. So, over to you, Paul. Thank you, Jenny. Well, thank you. The first thing I was going to say, which you've already said, so I'm very grateful to the panelists and for the contributors here. I mean, we seem to be tapped into lots of kind of expertise and, 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 and experience, and that's really, really important to, to do that. I mean, I was conscious that a number of kind of big issues, kind of people are concerned with big themes poverty, sustainable development, corporate social responsibility, social progress. Um, but the point that was made about kind of policy coherence, I think, is, is really important here because actually these things are not actually <coughs> that different. But yes, of course, you need to zoom in and concentrate on different areas. But at, at, the, at the heart of this, there's a commonality here about what progress means and what a society looks like mm -hmm. and how it's performing. So I think what we need to take away from this is the idea that you know, these aren't different areas; these are things that we need to work, work together. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't do the impossible and, and, and sum up every area, but let me, let me talk about some of the areas that we, 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 we talked in this we talk. Um, one thing that came out really was the need for, for clarity and to be clear about what we're talking about. A good example of that early on was, I mean, to be quite reminding us that a multi dimensional index produced from a coherent set of data is not the same as a composite index put together from a variety of different places and we need to care about that. But in fact, what we've mostly got out there are composite indices, and so we need to make sure we don't tar uh, everything with that, that, that brush and, and understand what we're doing. We had lots of discussions about weights and weighting, and I think that confirms the need again for, for, for clarity. What are the weights? Well, I think we moved on from calling them ambiguous, but instead, are they subjective? Do we understand where they come from? How we how we understand them? Um, one thing that we kind of touched on, but but kept shying away from, I suppose, because that's not the right people in the room, are the, the, the real-life data constraints that we have there. And we, as Glenn told us, that we are, you know, we, we're actually meeting in what is kind of a statistically well-developed nation. Um, so anything that we think is actually quite difficult here is, is, is impossible the further you go from, from London or from, from South Wales. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that we kind of probably thought through all the implications of that, but it's, it's, it's a huge, huge situation. That said, lots of good practice was talked about during the afternoon. I think we need to hang on to that. Transparency, um, uh, robustness, and, and, and testimony. testimony. Early on, I wanted us to kind of think about the uses of, of, of these indices. And I know mean, people kind of rose to that, that challenge. We heard a lot, though. Um, I think just certainly kind of fairly general terms that these are, these are kind of going to be used in policy in, in some way. Um, I mean, um, perhaps not to be in touch those people who are kind of um, using this in a very specific way in particular, particular countries. But some of the other indices, and Michael probably suggested this as well, that it's still relatively early, early days, days for these figures. Now, one thing Glenn, who's left me for a bit, can't challenge him, he said no one uses GDP in policy. I think what he meant by that was nobody uses the headline to do policy. Well, that may be true, but an awful lot of people use it in a political sense. And that's one thing I do think we should all take from today's meeting. Actually, it's not just about um, GDP, but the other indicators in the C we've been talking about um, are very much used in a political sense um, uh, and in um, uh, challenging governments, um, holding governments to account is one phrase that, phrase that, that, that we use. And I think, therefore, we need to understand the development of indices in a political sense, even if it's not in, 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 in policy. Um, and very, Important points made about uh, national, national data, data, indices for national use, or data for national use, and comparability across, across countries in international um, context. And there seems to be ways to solve this, which is, which is, which is great. Um, you, know, you can, in a sense, have the, 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 the indices and the data that address the local issues, and you have a comparator in there. But actually, that means that you've got at least two views to what's going on out there. And actually, sometimes you get more than that because you get somebody else's view. <laughs> So I think you need to kind of um, think, think that, 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 that one, that one through. Um, so all in all, I mean, I think we are at the early stages of a discussion. It's very healthy. It's been fascinating to have this discussion. Um, I think um, 
this is um, in these equations one of the biggest challenges um, <coughs> in uh, facing facing uh, uh, statisticians are facing big big compilers that index on uh, the data uh, compilers. Um, we kind of need to be very clear about using uh, using the data, inspiring some of these sectors. I think it's kind of very uh, uh, very important uh, role. Link back again to kind of corporate sector. Um, CSR, um, um, but actually it's about kind of um, working, working together using the, the information that's there. Um, a proliferation of measures is not a problem, but an opportunity, like I said. And I think that's that's something that we can work together. There certainly is a proliferation out there, and there may well be more so. Um, but what 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 what's the opportunity that that that, that, that could be? So that's all kind of very general, and I think. Then he said, well, okay, sum up and say, what next? <laughs> <laughs> and the what next, I, I'm sorry, you'll find me very, very lame because it's all kind of addressed back to my uh, working group colleagues. But I think that would be a starting point. We can have a discussion maybe. Okay. <coughs> I'll just down four things, and none of these are very profound. Um, the first one actually is that too often we hold a meeting, and we all think that was a fascinating meeting, and we all go away, and that, that's the end of it. Um, uh, I don't think you should do that. I'm be looking for ways in terms of following up. Um, we've got the this permission, we can use their material, use their slides, make them available. We've got the live streaming. Uh, uh, there'll be a version of this appearing on the on YouTube, on YouTube uh, later, later on as well. Um, but, but, but also, um, how, can, how can we in terms of keep this material, you know, get more use out of this material? Um, uh, Becky Dean is part of the that she mentioned over, over, over tea that one possibility might be kind of take this material out into other groups or into other countries and, and, and offer it. And I think we've got a robust you know, set of material here to start those, those discussions. So that's the first one, that, that what can the IDWG come up with in terms of you know, making uh, as much use as possible uh, of this data and some of the very important messages uh, that, that, that are in there. Um, the second one is around the kind of the, uh, mapping. I think, I mean, can we actually produce enough debate picture of at least what's there with all the flaws that that, 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 will, will, that will happen? Um, just the only slightly cheeky, but before the meeting, as Selena mentioned, we've actually done some work some years ago for DIFFIC, which has never actually been published. So maybe we could kind of tap into that and look for other ways of kind of just, at least with all the caveats, just putting out somewhere that this is our current view of the indices and uh, uh, multi-dimensional multi and multi Measures that, that, that we're looking at. Um, the third one, um, uh, what was I, uh, I think, oh yeah, the kind of, I had kind of seven questions here, and I think that was that one thing we learned from that before we seven, six or more ago, it's kind of a bit too many. I think we need to look at those again and say, well, what's the priority model? Reflecting on today's discussion, this is something that the IDWG should be doing. I'm encouraging the others to do, just do um, one of those. Uh, one or more of those areas. Um, but the third one and the fourth one, um, uh, somebody came up with the idea of uh, why don't we actually have to try and put some on Wikipedia would be better. Now there is a Wiki progress website out there. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to look at what does Wiki progress say about what it is. Um, uh, and secondly, it, not many people know about Wiki progress, I guess, but more people know about Wikipedia. So um, can we see if we can export some stuff or add some stuff? So no, this is, I don't want people to make it those. There's just a few kind of quick thoughts that we might want to take away and think about in our Thank you very much indeed, Paul. I think that's I think that's a um, that's a good short list of, of, of um, things that we could take forward um, in the not too distant future. Um, I mean, I must say I was I was very taken by um, the idea of, of, of a Wikipedia approach to map, mapping indices because you know the great thing about the Wikipedia approach is that we can all contribute can't we um, and uh, it's something that can grow organically rather than um, and within the resources available um, certainly um, the IDWG will be very keen to uh, make this um, make, make the materials available that we gathered this afternoon, both the presentations, 
the discussions, everything is recorded. Um, it would be good to think that um, people um, could use it as a basis for their own workshops. Um, the, the, there's certainly no uh, barriers to that as far as the RSS is concerned. Um, one, one other thing that um, is possible is actually to carry on the discussions ourselves on the RSS website, Stats Life. Um, we have, a, we have a, a, a presence there, the, IWD, the IDWG, and in fact the paper is up on, on the website, I think, Paul, isn't it? Um, so so um, it's, it's possible to um, carry on the discussion there. And indeed, addressing those who may have um, been following us um, on the live stream, there's an opportunity there for you too to um, contribute to the discussion, even though you haven't been able to do so in person today. Um, so I think um, you know that there's the, the, there's a lot of um, possible um, future action to to build on this afternoon. Um, one thing that I've been very struck with this afternoon is how many people preface their contributions by saying, I'm not a statistician, which is really great. It's, 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 it's great to feel that um, you know, this event has um, attracted people who are interested in the area but are not um, dyed in the wool statisticians. Um, so thank you all very much indeed for coming along uh, this afternoon, either in person on, or online. Um, thank you for your contributions. I hope you found it uh, a useful and interesting afternoon. I certainly have. Thank you very much to Paul who has masterminded the whole thing. All I had to do this afternoon was turn up. Uh, <laughs> and thank you to all, to, to our three um, speakers and panellists um, for their huge contribution to the success um, of this afternoon. It's, it's, it's been um, really great. I know some of you had difficulties <laughs> in getting here. I'm very pleased that you were able to do so. So let, let's show our appreciation in the time of the <laughs>